Good morning and welcome back to AM Joy. This week marked the beginning of the Trump era in Washington as a new Republican controlled Congress prep, uh, prepped for their White House takeover. But the moment was overshadowed by the party's surprise decision on Monday to try and weaken the Office of Congressional Ethics, an independent body created in the aftermath of several high profile scandals. On Tuesday, Donald Trump criticized the move on Twitter, calling the watchdog unfair, but adding that Congress had far more important things to focus on. Note that Trump still supported the Republicans' argument for neutering the office's powers, but took issue with the timing of the move. Hours after that tweet, House Republicans dropped their plans to gut the ethics office. And the collected media, never one to miss an opportunity to amplify a Trump tweet, swooped in, giving Trump the credit for supposedly strong-arming his own party into backing down and making good on his vow to drain the swamp. But that's not really what happened. The real story is that lawmakers reversed course after receiving thousands of phone calls from angry constituents and the outrage over the GOP's attempt to gut the ethics office started online. We watched it. That generated those phone calls hours before Trump weighed in. So we are here to set the record straight. This victory is for the people who called, who emailed, who tweeted at the representatives and held their feet to the fire. This is your victory, not Donald Trump's. And joining me now is Democratic Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota, who's running for chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Thank you for being here. And thank you for in having me. In person. Us. Well, you know, we're here in New York. It's good to be with you. Great to be here. So listen, let, I, I want to just talk to you about that very point. You are sure. a, a politician. You are a lawmaker. I am. Explain to the people just how sensitive political leaders are to phone calls and emails to their office. You know, this is one of the most important lessons to learn in a democracy. Calling your congressman works. It actually does. Do you get a lot of calls? We get a ton of calls, but when they start concentrating on a particular sub subject, we focus our attention on that subject. I mean, the thing is, I've had uh, folks call me on uh, horse slaughter, for example, and we got to dig into it and figure out what's going on. But when it's a big topic, immigration, ethics reform, when it's a big topic, you know, minimum wage, stuff like that, we really do drive uh, uh, based on what our constituents are telling us. So I, I tell people, you know, every single member of Congress and every state legislature and city council knows who put them in office and who can take them out. And if you exert your power, you can, uh, you can make a big difference. Yeah, and it's more powerful than a Trump tweet, for instance. Well, you know, politicians, <laughs> they see the light when they feel the heat. Yeah, there you and go. And it's not just some, some Trumpster over there. As a matter of fact, the president can't do much to or for members of Congress. Right. I mean, they can do issue veto threats, and that's, that's powerful. And of course, they have their own power. But members of Congress are pretty jealous about their own power. Yeah. And our line of accountability is to the district. Yeah. Article one of the Constitution, Congress, not the president. All right, sure. let, let's talk about some of the issues at issue in your race for DNC chair. Um, and we'll start first with the Bernie Sanders thing. We have to get sure. that out of, uh, off the table. Because one of the arguments, Vox has a great article about it. There are a lot of people who are making the argument that one reason to choose you is that Bernie Sanders supporters would feel that they'd gotten something in the bargain, that they'd gotten somebody who was a Sanders supporter early, then did support Hillary Clinton, but at least that you'd represent that point of view. Sure. Is that an important thing to do? or? What, or, or what do you make of the argument by a lot of Clinton supporters who say, wait, Bernie Sanders supporters aren't Democrats. We need to take care of Democrats first. Well, Bernie supporters are Democrats. I'm a Democrat. And, but I supported both because I believe we got to have inclusion. We, can we send anybody away? We need every single person, Democrat, potential Democrat, independent, Green Party member. We need them all because you know what? We live in the era of Donald Trump. And he is already moving quick to install the foreclosure king at Treasury, the, uh, the anti-public education person at education, the climate denier at EPA. There is no one we have to waste. And so my message is one of unity. All my fellow candidates in this race are friends. I love them and I honor their service. But I must say that no matter who wins, and I really believe I should, um, uh, we are all going to have to work together because there is a greater issue in here, and this is the welfare of the American people. Let's talk about another fundamental issue um, that I hear more than anything else probably in my Twitter feed, that people want to see the Democrats fight. They don't want to see them say, we'll work with Donald Trump if dot, dot, dot. Should Democrats work with Trump or fight Trump at every turn? Fight Trump at every turn? If there was an instant 
even a nanosecond in which we thought we might want to work with him, he's proven that that's a bad idea by his appointments. He's already shown what he wants to do. He's gotten more big time Wall Streeters in there than uh, anybody thought he would. He's getting people with you know nefarious ties uh, that he's associating with. I mean, his cabinet, for example, has in the midst of a rental housing crisis, he picks somebody who knows nothing about housing. You know, uh, Ben Carson. Ben Carson, so, neurosurgeon. So, so right. So, so we're at a point. We're at a point where he is made very clear. We have no common ground. It's our job to to, to fight Trumpism, and but not only just to verbally talk bad about it. We've got to go to the neighborhoods, to the VFW halls, the union halls, grocery stores, and hair shops, and talk to people in Detroit and Flint, but also in Kentucky. Both. We got to talk to both and explain to people not only the damage that he's doing to them, taking away their health care, won't even work on fixing the water crisis, but actually what we would do which is to help make government work for them. Well, so now you've, you've brought up another very important point, which is this question of whether to go searching for basically core Republicans. White working class voters are Republicans for the most part, even some who may have voted for Barack Obama a couple times. And in the main, they're Republicans. Whether should Democrats should go looking for them and trying to get them to come over or turn out their vote. Look, if Democrats had turned out 50,000 more votes in Detroit and Philly and Milwaukee, Hillary Clinton would be president right now. So which is the priority if you're DNC chair? Well, you've identified the short-term answer to why we lost, those three states. But we have a longer-term problem, which is that we've, been, we've lost four, five, 935 state house seats in the last eight years, many we, governorships. And so you're right in the short term, but in the long term, we really got to go 50 states and we've got to go 3,141 counties. We got to get granular. We got to get into the neighborhoods. And we got to use local people to go talk to their neighbors. And we've got the DNC should help them uh, do that with money, with uh, data, with uh, tools, technology, live stream, everything. That is how we're going to win. We've got to invest in the whole country and stop ignoring the people who we know will vote for us or who we know won't vote for us. And we've got to go talk to everybody. Yeah, one of the things that one of your opponents, uh, Tom Perez, who's uh, going for DNC chair, said needs to happen is for the DNC to fully fund the voting rights component in the DNC. There's an office, I guess, dedicated to voting rights. Sure. We haven't heard about it. We certainly didn't hear about it in this last election. Oh, boy. Um, do you agree with that idea? And how would it work under Keith Ellison as DNC chair? Well, I agree with Tom on this. Tom and I are friends, by the way. And uh, it's like a friendly game of basketball. I'm trying to win. <laughs> but no matter who wins, we're going to be buddies anyway. Uh, here's the, here's Here's the thing. Um, we absolutely have to fund that. Uh, but let me tell you, I'm the one who has dealt with voter suppression on the ballot. In 2012, Republicans in Minnesota tried to put a voter ID amendment on the, our Constitution, which would require a very restrictive uh, government-issued ID for you to vote. And my campaign, and I'm in the so-called safe blue seat, dedicated our campaign to defeating it. People ran polls and said, Keith, it's polling too good. We can't beat it. I said, I don't care about odds. I care about what's right and what's wrong. And we set out to defeat it, and we got help along the way, and we ended up beating it at the polls. You can beat voter suppression at the polls and in the courts. Both are important. The DNC chair, however, is primarily focused on electoral outcomes, yep. though we will fight them in court, too. All right, we're going to keep you here, uh, Keith Ellison. Now we've got you. We're not going to let you go. So we're going to uh, take a quick break and then more with Congressman Keith Ellison next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.